Okay, so with this video, we're going to start to get into the nitty gritty of actually buying kit. We've covered all the back, back end basics that you need to know, all the bits about looking at a kite, different things that affect a kite, things like that. Now we're going to actually look at when you walk into a shop, what you're going to be looking at, what are you going to be asking about, what are the things you need to know, okay? So, first thing is, what are you actually looking for in a kite? We've talked about high aspect, low aspect, all these different factors. What are we actually looking for in a kite? What you are looking for, quite simply, easy relaunch. Massively important. You're going to be dropping the kite a lot. So you need something that relaunches fast, especially to start with. When maybe your relaunch skills aren't that hot, you want a kite that helps you out in this, okay? And the biggest example of this I can give you is when you're actually practicing, you're going to be spending a lot of time fairly close to the shore because you want to kind of, you're going to want to stay fairly close in because obviously as you get further out, it's further to drag if something goes wrong. Now the problem with being close to the shore is there's these thing called waves, which if you drop your kite in the middle of the waves, it tends to get sucked down and tends to ruin your afternoon. So you want something that relaunches as instantly as possible. So easy relaunch is probably the biggest one. Stability. You want a kite that's not going to fall out of the sky as soon as there's a gust or a lull of wind. So you want something that's nice and stable, going to make your life nice and easy and by by the same factor, it's also fairly forgiving, i.e. you don't have to pilot it perfectly to get the performance that you need out of it. So something that's stable, something that's fairly easy handling. Needs a big wind range. Two reasons why you want a big wind range. One, it's going to depower a hell of a lot when you let go of the bar. That's a great thing from a safety point of view because it means that you don't have to worry too much about being overpowered. Even on most modern kites, even if you are massively overpowered, you can let go of the bar and the kite will flutter to the side under very little power, and that's a very good thing. The other advantage of a big wind range is it means you need to buy less kites. If you've got one kite that covers a wind range from, let's say, 10 to 20 knots, that's much, much better than having to buy two kites, one that goes from 10 to 15, one that goes to 15 to 20. It's going to save you a grand, even more when you're looking at kites. So you want a big wind range, so you don't have to think too much to start with about which kite do I put up, because that's always a really, really difficult question that really is very difficult for anyone else to help you with. Because you've just got to know your own riding style, your own weight, the conditions, different factors about the wind, different factors about the location, and you've got to kind of muddle it together over time. So a kite that you can actually adjust on the fly because it's got a big wind range, is a really, really good thing. The final element that we're going to, second to final element we're going to talk about, is safety. The kite has to be safe. Now, this is one thing that is often breezed over, especially, I know when I started, I was a year or whatever, the kite's safe, it's fine. I'm never going to release it anyway. The truth of the matter is you probably won't ever do a self-pack down. You won't need to do many self-pack downs, but when you need to do it, you need it all to work. So safety is a critical aspect, especially at the start, where you're probably going to be getting yourself into a few more scrapes, a few more sticky situations than you might like, and you really want that safety system to work 100% of the time. So make sure the safety system works, it functions, it releases onto one of the centre lines, and it's a proper safety system, i.e. not one of these that releases onto two centre lines. If you want more information on that, there's a few topics on the blog that we can talk about there. Um, but just make sure the safety system works, test it if you can before buying the kite. Final thing you need, and probably, going back over more, the most important, is the reason that we do kite surfing, is it's got to look cool, okay? Really, really important, especially if you're a girl, it's got to be nice and pink, okay? But the key word that you need to remember is free ride. Okay? There's many different categories of kites, and all manufacturers break their kites down. They'll never be a beginner's kite, or very, very rarely. Why? Because beginner kites simply don't sell. Because people walk in the shop, I'm not a beginner, or I won't be a beginner in six months' time, ergo I'm not going to buy a beginner's kite. Now the mistake people make is that they then link free ride up with beginner kite. It's not so. I've been kite surfing 10 years, I still ride a free ride kite. Most of my friends here in Tarifa who've been riding at least as long as I have ride free ride kites. Why? Because a free ride kite is designed to do exactly what it says. It gets you out in all conditions. It's a jack of all trades, a master of none, which depending on where you live is probably an awesome thing, but certainly for a beginner stroke intermediate rider, someone looking to buy their first kite, unless they're very, very certain, I want to be a wave rider, I want to be a freestyle rider, and even if they are, I would suggest buying a free ride kite. Why? Because it does all these things we've talked about. It will be built to easy relaunch, be nice and stable, have a big wind range, be safe. 
Okay, will do all these things really well because that's what a free ride car is designed to do. What it won't do is boost you all the way to heaven and back. It won't ride up wind like the clappers. It won't do any one thing particularly well, but it will do a mixture of all of them very well, as good as it needs to do, okay? And the other reason for this is, look, most of us aren't going to be riding in somewhere like Maui or somewhere like Dakla where it's perfectly flat water. Most of us are going to ride somewhere where from day to day the conditions change. So someday you've got waves, someday you've got flatter water, some days you've got bump and jump conditions. This is the style of riding that the free ride kite is the master of. Gets you out in all conditions. It's fairly plug and play. There's not too much you need to know about tweaking the kite. It just works out of the bag generally. So this is why these kites are so good. If you then want to specialise down the line into it, right, I've done all this, I want to become a dedicated wave rider, and I kite surf enough in a spot with waves that it's worth doing, because bear in mind a wave kite isn't going to do the other things very well, because it's a specialist, then you can start to specialise. Likewise, you can go down the freestyle route. I live in a place where it's fairly flat water. I want to be doing tricks all the time. I want to buy a freestyle kite. Okay, but as I say, a lot of people, especially here in Tarifa, where we do get this mix of conditions, buy free ride kites because they can only afford to buy one set of kites to start with. They can't afford to have a wave set and a freestyle set. And the free ride will get them out on every single day and have them you know, have a good time on, or let them have a good time on those days, as opposed to having to swap and change and tweak the kit from time to time. So the key word that you're looking for is free ride. Most manufacturers, well, every manufacturer has a free ride kite. The category is it breaks down into generally free ride, wake style, new school or freestyle. Freestyle not to be confused with free ride, they're very different things. Wave kites, race kites, sometimes you get light wind kites as well. They're the major categories of kites that you get. Okay? So your one you're looking for is free ride. So we've narrowed down what type of kite you want. You want to walk into a shop, you want to ask to see their free ride kites. Now the next big decision that you're going to have is should I buy new or should I buy used? Now this is the age old question. I can't tell you what you should do. What I'm going to do is point out the pros and cons of each. So you can see some of these are really obvious and I'm blatantly going to be teaching you to suck eggs. Some of them are not so obvious. So just bear with us and we'll go through these and you can see which one breaks down for you. Now a lot of this is going to depend on how much you're going to go kite surfing and how much money you've got in your wallet to spend on this. Okay, so you've got to make your own decision on it. I'll give you the pros and cons. The, the obvious thing I would start to, to, to talk about this is if you're only going to kite surf once a year in a resort that hires kit, you're probably going to be better hiring kit rather than buying it and having it sitting there rotting for a year while you're going away. So look at how much you're going to kite surf and adjust your metrics based on that. Do you want to buy kit? Do you want to just hire it? Is kite surfing something you're only going to do when you go away to Egypt, to Tarifa, to Dakla, to Brazil and kite surf there for a week in a resort that has, has loads of kit? Well, in that sense, you're going to be better off to, to hire their kit. If, you've got a, if you live at the beach, you've got a spot right next door that you're going to be going kite surfing every weekend, I would suggest you want to buy your own kit. Why? Because hiring kit gets very expensive. Kites break very easily. So companies can't afford to hire kit out cheaply at all. So you're going to pay through the nose after five, six, seven sessions. You're going to basically have spent the same money as you would to buy a used kite. So it doesn't work out very economical to hire kit over a long period of time. So that's the first question you've got to answer. Are you going to buy new? Are you going to buy used? So what we'll do now is we'll run through the advantages of each so you can start to see the differences and make a better decision on what you want to do. So, starting with new kites, what is the downside? Well, the massive downside of new kites is the price. They're going to cost, a new kite now can cost anything from 700 to 1500 euros. Okay, so when you're bouncing that off the beach, when you're just starting out, that really hurts. That really hurts watching that kite bounce off the beach. Okay, that's the obvious major downside. The upsides. You know the kite's history. You know exactly where it's come from. It's come straight from the factory to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So everything should work straight out of the bag. You should just take that, bag, that kite out, put it together, and it will work from there. So nice and easy. It eliminates problems of trimming, things like this. You know, right, cool, this kite's set up. The bridle's attached properly. Everything works. No one's tweaked with it beforehand, and the factory settings are still set in. So you don't need to know too much or worry too much about the fine-tuning of the kite because it's probably been put in a place by the factory where it's more or less ready to go. Okay, so you can just start to play with it a little bit and it's good to go out of the bag. On the same note, because of this, because it's from straight from the factory, it shouldn't have any minor defects, any undetectable problems, any pinholes, any problems with the bladder. Everything should just work out of the bag. And added to that, most new kites these days come with a warranty. A lot of companies are doing a year, two year. Some companies like Best are even offering a lifetime warranty. 
which can be really useful. Now this doesn't mean that if your kite breaks, they're gonna give you money back, whatever. It means they've got a list of issues that are warranty issues, and if you ring them up and say, look, this has happened to my kite, they'll say, oh yeah, cool, that's on the list, that's a warranty issue. Send your kite back, we'll send you a new one, or they'll just send you a new one, however that company works. So this is something that's worth bearing in mind with new kites. It's worth registering your kite on their website. Yes, you do get some emails, but it's worth it because if your kite breaks and it's a warranty issue, the companies are often very, very good at honouring this warranty. They often err on the side of you rather than on the side of the kite of themselves. So they'll often be, be very good about actually honouring this warranty. So it's worth, it's worth something that's worth thinking about when you buy a new kite. It will come with the correct bar. Now this might sound small, we'll talk about this more when we talk about used kites, but just for the no, remember this is a huge advantage. It will come with the bar that is designed for that kite. So again, it goes back to this idea of plug and play. There's no need to worry about changing bar line length, does the safety work, la la la. You just set the kite up on the right bar, boom, and you're good to go, okay? So they're the main advantages of a new kite. So now we're going to talk about used kites. Now the obvious upside of a used kite is the price. The second hand market in kite surfing is vibrant and at the moment you can pick up a good used kite for about a third of the price of a new kite. So you can see on the flip side, buying new is a bit like buying a car. The price decreases very fast. So you can be buying a year old used kite and it may be 500 euros and it's in good nick. Okay, so the used kite market is vibrant. A few problems, however. One, you don't know its history. The owner might be telling you, look, this kite's only been flown twice. Okay, that's great. But as we'll see in a minute, it's not the actual flying time that knackers the kite. It's the time that the kite is actually out in the sun, the sand, the wind. These things will knacker the kite up. So you've got to be a little bit careful about an owner. He might be selling you in good faith. This kite's only been flown twice. Well, yeah, but it's been left on the beach for 200 hours. So the kite is dead, okay? So he might not know that he's dead, but he, just simply because he doesn't know enough about the kite and kite surfing and how kites degrade, okay? So again, when it comes to things like pinprick holes, which without knowing how to do it, if you just lay the kite out on the ground and have a look at it, there's no way you can see them. There's no way you can see these tiny, tiny holes, which coincidentally are most often caused by someone smoking upwind of a kite. Now in a fag, the wind blows off, blows some ash off onto the kite, tiny, tiny, tiny pinprick hole, but now you've got this point, this weak point on the kite, which as soon as it's discovered by the wind and by the wave, which it will discover it very quickly, <sighs> tears your kite in half. So be aware of that, something that you need to be checking for. And again, he might be selling you it or she might be selling you it in good faith. Yeah, this kite's in perfect condition. It's got 10 pinprick holes in it, which no one, you can't see, he hasn't seen, she hasn't seen. And there becomes this big argument as to, well, you saw me this kite, and he said, no, it was, it was in great nick, you must have done something with it, la la la. And this can be a problem with the used kite, so be careful for that one. We'll teach you how to check for these in just a minute, okay? Finally, does it come with the correct bar? Now, this is something that often happens. You walk into a shop, a second-hand shop, cool. There's a second-hand kite. Oh, and he just dips into the bucket, picks out the bar. Well, this bar's got the same length of all lines, so we can work with this kite. Cool. There you go. There's your kite and bar. Great. Most likely, 99.9%, .9 that will work fine. However, two things you've got to be aware of. We have, on different bars, slightly different systems for the center lines. We have what's called a high V or a low V. Now, let me draw this for you. This is our low V bar, okay? So you've got there, you've got the chicken loop, here you've got the trim strap, and from the trim strap, the center line split into a V. This is a low V bar. We also have, same thing, trim strap, a high V bar. Now what happens here is you have another line, a single line running in the middle, and then the center line split in the middle like that. So you've got high V, low V. Now, what we found is that very often, a kite that's designed for a high V bar will not fly on a low V bar and vice versa. Sometimes you can get away with it, sometimes you can't, because simply put, this is being pinched at a different angle. So the angle of those lines running up to the kite pulls the kite into a different shape, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. So something to be aware of there. So apart from the low or the high V, the other thing you need to be looking at is is it actually safe to use that bar on your kite? Now what we're looking at here, some, kite, some bars, some of the older bars especially, come with a stopper ball. Okay? And this is designed that when you flag the kite out, 
it, the stopper ball stops the bar from disappearing all the way up to the kite, but it's often set at a specific point for that kite size. Uh, if that bar is a short bar for a seven meter kite, it will be set quite low down because it doesn't need to go as high up to flag the kite out as it would on say a 12 meter bar. So you need to just check that the safety is set up properly for the kite you're going to fly. So what I would suggest if you're going to buy a second hand kite with a different bar, take it down the beach or take it to a field and just give it a fly. While you're doing that, test the safety system. Just check the whole thing works. Check it works with that, whether it's high V or low V. And check the safe system depowers fully, i.e. the kite flags out and depowers fully as it's doing it. So you've decided to buy the used kite, which isn't necessarily my recommendation. All I'm saying is let's just go down that avenue and explore it a little bit more. If you're going to buy a used kite, there's a few things that you need to check before you buy the kite. A few simple tests that will tell you whether it's in good condition or whether it's ready for the bin. Okay, the one thing which never, ever, ever lies, it's impossible, it simply has to tell the truth, is the trailing edge of the kite. Now, if you take the kite and just feel where the thick, but there's, oh, there's always at the, at the trailing edge of a kite, gonna be a reinforced section, which then attaches to the main canopy. Okay, sometimes it'll be straight, sometimes it'll be curved, it depends, but they will always be the same. Sometimes it'll be thick, sometimes it'll be fairly thin. But along that line, there's a seam. Now what you want to do is feel the canopy material just next to that stitching. What you want to do, the way I would look at this, is go and, go and try a new kite. Go and feel the canopy of a new kite and feel what that feels like. And then come back to your used kite and feel the back, the trailing edge at the point we've just talked about. It should be as close to the new feel as possible. Because what happens is, if you've ever seen a flag, imagine a flag flapping in the wind. Look at the back of the flag, what happens to the back of the flag? it falls to pieces. This is exactly what happens to your kite, okay? especially when we have it sitting on the beach. So as the wind's blowing over that kite, the back of the kite is flapping and it's being degraded. So the material is getting thinner and thinner and more and more worn. So by testing this part of the kite, we can see how much the kite's been used. And this is going back to what we were saying earlier. The guy that you're buying the kite might say, look, this kite's only been flown for two hours. Yeah, that's cool but it's been sat on the beach in the wind for 200. And all that time, the wind's been flapping over the trailing edge and degrading the trailing edge to a point where it's now falling to pieces. So that kite is ready for the bin, even though it's only been flown for two hours. Because guess what? When the kite's actually flying, is the trailing edge flapping? No, the trailing edge isn't flapping. So the worst thing you can actually be doing for your kite is walking along with it behind you flapping in the wind when you could be flying it. Because by flying it, the back end's not flapping, it's nice and solid in the sky and it's not being degraded anywhere near as much, which is quite difficult for people to, to, to realize to start. People think that by holding the kite and walking along, they do a lot less damage than flying the kite. Fly the kite as much as you can. It makes it last longer, okay? So, what we're talking about, the trailing edge. So what you want to do is feel the back of the trailing edge. Now it should feel, on a very, very new kite, you'll have kind of a film, an oily film on top. This disappears very quickly, but what you're not looking for, what you don't want is for that trailing edge to feel like that toilet paper that we all had to use in primary school. The stuff that feels like tracing paper, okay? If it feels like that, and if when you hold it up to the sun, you can see a lot of very well-defined stretch marks going across the kite, and even more importantly, if there are tiny, tiny pinprick tears starting to appear in the trailing edge, the kite's dead. Because as soon as you get those little tiny holes starting to appear, that kite's got two or three flights in it until that whole trailing edge tears and the kite's ready for the bid. So in that case, it's not a bargain. So what you want is for the trailing edge to be as, as close to the material of a new kite as possible. Now, even when the kite's been flown once, that trailing edge already starts to degrade. So it's never gonna be perfect. But a really good test is to feel the material at the front of the kite, really close to the leading edge, and then compare it to the material at the back of the kite. And that will give you a good idea of how old the kite is and how old that trailing edge is as well. So this is one thing that never, ever lies, the trailing edge. It's the key, key factor in looking at a kite. So the first thing I always check, and it's the definitive one. If the trailing edge is knackered, the kite is knackered, no matter what the man who's trying to sell you, it tells you. Okay, because as I say, this might not be through him trying to be an honest John, this could be just through lack of knowledge on his part. You know, the kite's been sat there for so long that the trailing edge has just degraded, even though the kite hasn't been used that much. So that's the big one, the trailing edge. Other things you want to look at. The obvious one that everyone always talks about is repairs. 
Now, we've had plenty of kites that we've torn in two, literally. Some of them, when they get repaired, come back and fly almost as new. Some of them come back and will not fly. A lot of this depends on how clean the tear was, and a lot of it depends on how good the repair job has been. So a massive repair in a kite isn't necessarily the end of that kite. What it does mean sometimes you can pick up a bargain because the guy knows, well look, it's had a massive repair, it's really obvious, I've got to knock 100, 150 euros off the price. But before you're gonna buy it, fly it. The two things you're looking for with a huge repair is when you put the kite up, does it trap very easily to one side? I mean, does it generally tend, on lines at the same length, does it tend to track to one side because that, that canopy's been pulled a bit tighter, or is a bit slacker, so it's naturally generating more or less power than the other side. And when you turn it, does the trailing edge of that canopy flap, and you will hear this as it turns. Because again, that's indication that the repair's been done either too tight or too slack, and now the kite is slightly deformed, and when you turn it, that deformation is being revealed. Okay, so the other two things I would look at with the big repair, if it doesn't do either of those things and it seems to fly nice, you might be getting a bargain. If it's a repair job been done well, you might just be getting a kite that's 150 euros less than you'd be paying for it without the repair, and it flies pretty much the same. Tiny, tiny repairs that have been patched, no big deal. Again, I would probably question it if there was hundreds of them or tens of them, but if there's just one or two small like sail tape patches, absolutely not a problem. They will not affect how the kite flies at all. Um, or very, very little, undetectable amounts for me and you. So that's not a problem. One thing that is worth checking, the valves. Pump the kite up, leave it for half an hour. Leaky valves are very, very easily fixed, but they're a real pain in the ass, especially because most people don't fix them because we're too lazy. So you take the kite, I think oh, it stays up for long enough, it'll be all right. After half an hour, the kite's starting to fold. You've got to come back in and pump it up again, which is a pain in the ass. Get it fixed, okay? Get it and ask him, look, the valve's leaking, can you fix it? Or the valve's leaking, can you fix it before I buy it off you? Okay, he'll take it away, get it fixed, bring it back, cool, you're good to go. Or you'd get the price of the repair knocked off it and you take it to the repair shop. Nice and easy. The other big one to look for, and this is probably the, the second biggest thing after, after the trailing edge, the one that I would always look for, and especially before you put the guy up, it's not a... It's not a deal ender if there are these pin, what we're talking about, sorry, pin prick holes. If there are these pin prick holes in the kite, it's not a deal ender, but you need to pick them up, you need to detect them before you go and fly the kite. Because they can really, literally, if you've got one of these pin prick holes and you don't patch it, you put the kite up, oof, tears in half, you've got two kites. The best way, the only way that I've found to detect them, pump the kite up, preferably on a sunny day, get under the kite and hold the canopy up and really look under the canopy up towards the sun and if you've got any of these pin prick holes you should see the sunlight beaming through. As soon as you see that, patch the pin prick hole and move on it. Do the whole kite like this. Again, if you're buying a used kite and it's got a lot of these, I would start to question, well, okay, what's this kite been used for? If it's just one or two, that's perfectly normal. Okay, and you can just patch them and the kite will fly as if nothing's happened to it. So don't worry too much about one or two, but you need to be picking these up before you fly the kite. Okay? Another thing to look at is the stitching, especially along the leading edge where the seams of the leading edge join, because that's where when the kite impacts on the ground or when you self-launch and land, that's the part of the kite that takes the most damage. So if the stitching's starting to come out, again, it's not the end of the world, but if you don't get it re-stitched, the kite, the bladder will hernia out through that point. So it's worth getting it stitched up before you buy the kite or before you fly the kite rather than after and trying to recover it because a hernia in bladder can cause huge damage to, to literally write the kite off. So it's worth getting that fixed nice and early. A last one which is quite sneaky, which you can use to determine if a kite's been used a lot more than the, the owner is telling you, is the bar. If the bar that is being sold with the kite is the original bar and lines that came with that kite, the bar ages much more visibly than the kite. So if you look at a new bar and lines and then look at an old bar and lines, there's an immediate visual difference. It's faded, it's slightly damaged, it's just obvious the lines are starting to fray. And if you've got a really, really old bar that's been sold with this kite that he's telling you is new, well, maybe it is, maybe he's used that bar with, let's say you're buying a 12 meter kite, maybe he's used that bar with a seven meter kite and the 12's never been out of the bag. But again, it's just an indication that maybe the kite's been used a little bit more than he's laying on at the moment. So it's just something I would check. The bar's a really, really useful one for, for seeing that, because again, it won't lie to you. Okay, again, obviously this doesn't work if it's not the right bar and not the same bar that he bought the kite with. And how do you know he's telling the truth about that? Well, you don't. 
in general, and I'm saying so, and this is people, everyone's going to be trying to rip you off in this business. People are very, very good about this. People are very honest. People are very upfront. We Kai Surfers tend to be an honest bunch, okay? So you can generally trust people. But this is just to give you a bit more confidence in what you're talking about when you, if you do decide to go down that route of buying a used kite. Okay, so they're the key things that you want to be looking at. Final question we're going to cover here is what size kite should I buy first? Now the problem with this whole presentation is that I can't say to you, this is the kite you need to buy. I can give you a lot of guidelines on what you're looking for, what you're not looking for, and hopefully guide you down a route where you're making a more informed decision. But the ultimate test is that you're gonna to have to walk into a shop and buy that kite. Now, again, I can offer you advice. I can't say when it comes to size, oh, you need to buy a 14, you need to buy a 12. It will depend on your ability, your weight, and your location. Okay, so my best advice is to go to your local beach, go to your local shop and say, look, I'm a 75 kg 